one of the biggest advantages of commercial is because of all of this math that I described that you have to get your head wrapped around, if you get a mastery of that math, you can create huge swings of wealth and value in the building very, very quickly by just understanding where to alter the spreadsheet with very minimal force put in. Welcome to the Commonwealth Home Ownership Podcast, the real estate investing podcast for Canadians. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, you've come to the right place. If you're looking for a way to take control of your life through real estate investing, stay tuned and be sure to join us at cwho.ca, your hub for all things real estate investing in Canada. All right. Well, James, uh, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Commonwealth Home Ownership Real Estate Investing Podcast. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be invited back, and I just can't wait to chat with you guys about some more real estate stuff. Thanks yeah. for having me. Anytime, man. Last time, we kind of talked a lot about um, your kind of your approach to real estate as a realtor. So yeah. why, don't we, why don't we take a different perspective this time? Let's, why don't we do it from a perspective of, you know, of uh, an investor slash business person and absolutely, you know, and uh, kind of take it from that angle. That works for you. That works great for me. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Okay. First of all, like what's going on? I know you, you just, you know, you've been busy over the last year and a half. You uh, you've outgrown your Calgary off, uh, sorry, Edmonton office. And now you're yeah. moving. You just have to believe you just opened up a branch in Vancouver, right? We did. Yeah. So I'm, I'm broadcasting from the Vancouver office today. Um, and yeah, we opened a branch in Vancouver. The Edmonton office is still very, very strong and very healthy. So for those of you tuning in, give us a call. We'll help you out in Edmonton, but now we'll also help you out in Vancouver, which is super exciting. Um, so just that expansion has been very, very time consuming, building the systems, building the business and just learning how to manage two teams in two locations that have similar needs, but different needs. Um, has been just mind expanding. You know, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's a level up that excites me as an entrepreneur. So that's been super awesome. On the, uh, on the investor side, we picked up a 24 unit apartment building um, about, oh gosh, the closing was in fall six, seven, eight months ago now. Okay. And uh, just keeping my eyes open for the next opportunity. You know, I, I'm pretty comfortable with my portfolio size. So I'm not in like that aggressive growth phase where I want the next deal as quickly as possible. But you know, the universe just when you're in the position that uh, I'm lucky enough to be in, the universe just plunks interesting opportunities in my lap from time to time. And when the when the right one will shows up, then I'll, I'll get my button gear and move on to acquiring it. So, you know, I'm just kind of waiting for the next one to come to me. So what is your I mean, do you have a goal? I know that, like, you know, for a lot of investors, they have an acquisition phase, a consolidation phase, and then kind of like the, you know, try to pay off everything. Do you have those phases? Or are you just kind of just taking it as they come. Yeah, I'm, I'm in that third phase, which I would call the deleveraging phase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, how for those of you who are listening to a body build, body built, you know, you, you kind of bulk and then you cut mm -hmm. and then you're shredded for the show. So I've done my bulking. I probably bought properties I shouldn't have bought. I've got more properties than I need. And so, you know, I've been slowly picking off the ones that aren't the best fit for the portfolio redistributing that equity into paying down the ones that I want to keep. And, you know, ultimately I'm in the phase right now where my end game is zero leverage, zero debt, tight circle of really great properties that just, you know, cash flow without any mortgage expense whatsoever. So that's kind of where I'm at. But, you know, with the asterisks that like, hey, if a super cool, interesting deal that checks 10 out of 10 of my boxes comes up, then you know, I'll, I'll maybe add that one to the portfolio and get rid of a couple of extra ones that I don't need. So James, where, where was it that you started then? You talk about assets that you look at and you go, huh, maybe this is not the best one to hold yeah. on to. Like you, you just bought a 24 unit building. Did you start in commercial? Was it more in the residential side? It was, it was residential, my start. Yeah, I bought, the first house I bought, I basically bought a frat house and it was me and my buddies living in the house. They were paying the rent. I got to live for free rolled that into buying another house, rented that house to more buddies and the houses were up the street from each other. So it, it was a good setup, a good setup for a bunch of guys in their mid twenties. I'll tell you that much. And we, we, we terrorized the block for a couple of years there. And then, you know, the trap I got into is before I really got any serious real estate education, I was, I was a price investor, not a value investor. 
And so, you know, I analyzed properties on paper in sketchy parts of town where the cash flow on paper was sky high without anybody taking me under their wing and saying, just because the, the, you know, the cash flow might look high on paper, but by the time you deal with high tenant turnover, high repairs and maintenance, tenant headaches, da 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 vacancies, this cash flow number that you're hoping for on paper is probably not going to exist in reality. Nobody told me that. I got to learn that the good old-fashioned way, which was, you know, putting in a ton of time, effort, and headache into learning that lesson. So my, my initial start, um, there's, a, there's a neighborhood in El, uh, Edmonton called Alberta Avenue mm-hmm. and bought a, sh- a whole bunch of crusty old suited houses on Alberta Avenue that were cheap, cheap, cheap. And um, those are the ones I've been slowly and surely weeding out and picking off and redistributing the equity <laughs> into better locations and newer properties as uh, time has gone on. Yeah, that's the, sorry, it's a, the old saying, boring real estate. You, you bought the opposite of boring real estate, but it, it, the opposite was not necessarily, didn't mean it was fun real estate. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, busy, busy real estate, cost, costly. Busy is the perfect word for it. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, exciting, but you know, not all excitement is good excitement. <laughs> so yeah, it was very busy real estate, very busy real estate. Yeah. yeah. It was funny you say that because I was actually, when I started, I was actually looking at Alberta Avenue myself for those same reasons, right? And then uh, luckily, what, uh, my dad, knowing the you know, city a bit better, talked me out of it because, yeah, I mean, it was, it's not the best part of town, right? And it's, to be fair, I mean, I, you, you're there a bit more than I am now being in Calgary, but is it getting better? It's been getting better for 25 years now. <laughs> Not enough to keep them, hey, James? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only, the only reason that my experience in Alberta Avenue has kind of stabilized is because I've owned the properties for so long and paid them for people that I can afford to rent them out for well below market value. And so, you know, you make, you make the rent cheap enough and that'll attract good tenants. So all my Alberta Avenue properties have great tenants, but the rents are 100 150 200 below what market should be in the area but then i have people that haven't left in five to ten years so that was kind of that was like me waving the white flag whereas instead of trying to push rents and push rents and push rents i just put really high quality like stable tenants in place because you kind of just when you when you offer a big enough discount you kind of get to pick your customer mm-hmm. yeah so, and the longevity is key yeah so what is your strategy now i guess when it comes to real estate investing what do you look for now as opposed to just being a price investor like what do you look for in value for your yeah properties? number one number one's location look and probably like triple location 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 i i'm very very into location and one of the things i have learned um getting into the vancouver market is like lot size matters in a big way and in you know in calgary and edmonton we don't really realize how important that is um and because we see like so many lots are so big and we just have so much land kicking around at Edmonton that, you know, it's like, oh, psh, no big deal. But when it comes to, and I mean, in Edmonton, I own a lot of great pieces of land or a lot of properties on great pieces of land now that'll make sense in 20, 30 years to redevelop. Um, there's something called an FSR, which, um, which basically is a multiplier that tells you how, based on the size of the lot, how big of a building can you build on that lot? So like, having a lot that's 10 feet deeper or having a lot that's two or three feet wider. I mean, when it doesn't matter when you have an old bungalow on it, but in 20 years, when you go to redevelop a townhouse complex or a small multifamily, well, that could mean an extra 500, 700 square feet, which is the size of a suite. And so like those little squeaks of land, those little slivers of extra lot size mean like are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars of development potential in Vancouver. And as that land becomes developable in Edmonton, that extra little bit of land value, that lot being that extra little bit bigger, means a huge, huge deal when it comes to developable potential. Even though right now in Edmonton, it's like, you know, the land's worth 50 bucks a square foot on this lot. Who cares? Well, when you're playing the long game, you really, really want to care. So some of the, like the property that we just acquired, uh, the 24 Sweeter, um, it's got two apartment buildings on about three quarters of an acre and there's like a courtyard between the two buildings that's basically big enough to build another building it doesn't make dollars and cents to build another building there now but again when we go to potentially redevelop the site in the future we're going to have so much more space to build a bigger floor plate and more more suites 
as an investor, if you were in Vancouver, how would you go about investing there at all? Yeah, if- I mean, if, from our Alberta perspective, cash flow is the name of the game. I mean, we're all cash flow investors. We want to buy yeah. it. We want to make cash flow. Mm-hmm. But in Vancouver, I mean, we sold a condo the other day where the purchaser of that condo, it was like a $750,000 condo, which by Edmonton or Calgary standards, you're like, oh, that sounds like a pretty big, luxurious condo. But when you keep in mind, you know, things are at like 1100 a foot. That's like, that was like a one bedroom, one bathroom, downtown, you know, high rate condominium. So as a furnished rental, that thing's going to lose that person 800 bucks a month. And for them, you know, they're like, okay, I think this $750,000 condo is going to be worth 850 within the next two or three years. So if I'm losing $7,200 a year for three years, I'm investing $21,000 in negative cash flow for a hundred thousand dollar gain. Like that's, that's the spreadsheet. That's the math that they're, that they're calculating into the equation. And so they're like, okay, down payment plus negative cash flow equals investment gain is return on investment. Yeah. This makes sense to me. And then that, that, that equation gets turbocharged when you look at properties on appealing pieces of land, because the, like Vancouver is at this, at this, um, like when they say there's not any more land out here, it's really true. Like, it's not like Edmonton and Calgary where it's like these concentric rings of new houses in the burbs that are pushing out into farmland. It's like the, like when you stand under the edge of Vancouver and look down towards downtown, it's just like cranes and infill everywhere. Like it's just this constant churn of old stuff being torn down and newer, more high density stuff being built in its place. Yeah. Which was the, really the birth of all the assignments that started, uh, just rapidly, uh, you know, occurring out in, in Vancouver, you know, you could purchase a con, you probably still can purchase a condo, assign the contract before the thing's even built and make some money along the way. Yeah. I mean, that, that, uh, that's definitely true. Pre-sales, pre-sales are huge at Vancouver and Toronto. People love their pre-sales, but anybody that took possession of a pre-sale, you know, in the last eight months due to COVID, probably didn't make that money. So there were definitely a couple of people who, you know, that's the risk you take is it's very speculative. And every so often, you know, you roll the dice and the wrong number comes out. How yeah, about the other direction then? I mean, the, you know, one end is this mountains and ocean, but if it, is it, you find the values are pushing out towards the east at all now that Vancouver is so built up and uh, overvalued, overpriced? Yeah, when I say I, I say Vancouver, but I mean lower mainland. Okay. I mean, you know, we've got you know Richmond, Langley, Abbotsford, Chilliwack, yeah. um, Coquitlam, Maple Ridge. Like all these cities are experiencing upward pressure too, because um, there is a lot of farmland, especially kind of between Richmond and Abbotsford. But all of that land is protected farmland, so like they're not approving that to get turned into burbs. So there's very little land left um, from Langley inwards that is allowed to be converted into subdivision in the same way as Edmonton. So, you know, when you're flying into Vancouver, you look out of the plane window and you're like, oh yeah, there's lots of little farms down there, but like those farms are not going anywhere. Do you think it'll stay that way? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if it, it would have made great financial sense to redevelop that land 15 years ago. So the, the protections are pretty, pretty firm. I mean, every so often you see it happen, but it's not, it's not at the prodigious pace we see. Uh, in Alberta where like, you know, an entire quarter section leveled at every like two or three years, you know, Mm -hmm. like bam, 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 bam. You know, it'll be like this little five acre parcel. Somehow, some way they like had an in with the city to get it rezoned and permitted to put 20 houses in like that, that amount of inventory isn't keeping up with demand. That's just crazy over there. Hey, let's, um, I just want to quickly talk about your growth strategy they to, to kind of get to where you've been to now and uh let's start with the real estate side i want to talk i want to talk a little bit more about your brokerage side your business side as well a little bit later totally, on yeah. but in terms of your real estate like how did you get to the multifamily stage from going from uh single residential uh you know it it was i would say a leap of faith maybe was the right word for it like when i was in my early 20s i thought 30 by 30 sounded like a pretty catchy goal to set for myself. So I wanted to own 30 houses by the time I was 30. Um, and I got pretty close, but by the time I hit house 23 or 24, um, you know, I was just about 30 and I said, you know what? I don't want seven more houses. I want to try multifamily. So, you know, just pivoted, started asking questions. Um, you know, the, the way that I learn is conversationally. So taking multifamily realtors, multifamily mortgage brokers, realtor, um, lawyers, 
uh, appraisers, like anybody that touches multifamily, I'm just take them out for coffee, take them out for lunch and just pick their brain for an hour. And my, my personal process when it comes to learning stuff like that is I'm very, very focused. So like, I'll come in with a question list ahead of time and then just like, okay, I'm going to get the most out of this hour. I have 20 questions I want to ask you. Let's do this. As opposed to like, hey, I'm going to pick your brain. So uh, tell me about multifamily. You know, like you'll get some information, but, you know, and then as I evolve into learning stuff, it's like, there are some questions where if you ask 20 people, you get 20 different answers. Those are the, it depends questions. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are accounting questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are some questions where like the answer is the answer. Like how does a cap rate work? You only need to ask that question one time. So, you know, I just kind of rewrite my question list every time as I learn which questions depend on certain variables and which questions have pretty black and white answers. So anyways, got to the point where I felt like I learned enough. And then one of the multifamily um, mortgage brokers I met, he was pretty keen on buying multifamily and we decided, Hey, let's, let's partner up you and I, I think we could make a good team. And, you know, within a month and a half, he found a building saying like, Hey, I think these numbers work, we approach it. And so we made a pro forma and, you know, based on my network, I just started doing the JV hustle raised the capital and bought it. And then it just snowballed from there. So is, James, is that something that you had done previously, the, the joint venture side of things? Yeah, 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 it definitely was. I mean, all the joint ventures I had done were in personal names, one-to-one -one joint ventures up until that point. So like, you know, very, very, very classic style joint venture that gets taught tons of different places where it's like one partner, one house, you know, you go 50-50 on it, working partner, money partner, they put up the money, they get the mortgage, away you go. Um, repeat, repeat, repeat. There were some partners I got multiple houses with, some partners were one-offs. And then, um, so I was very familiar with the pitch. And then, you know, one of the things that I was very, very thoughtful with is I deal with so many investor clients as a realtor that anytime, you know, I, I always ask as part of the, the relationship build, like, oh, if you saw the right deal, would you be interested in partnering in on it? Anybody who said yes, put a little asterisk beside their name. And then when I have the deal, I just flip through all the asterisks and give them a call. Yeah, I think it's super important for anyone starting out to realize that joint ventures are still just a tried and tested way of building a portfolio to eventually end up buying a 24 unit building. Of course. I mean, it's not just a real estate thing. All types of businesses are built on business partnerships. I mean, you know, you, you hear the term angel investor or venture capitalist, all angel investors and venture capitalists are the money partners in all kinds of different businesses. Like it's, you know, I mean, in, in real estate, when you go to your first real estate conference and hear the term joint venture, you're like, ooh, that sounds advanced and interesting and fascinating and sexy. And then as you get to learn about the business of business, it's just, that, that's, that's kind of how business works. Mm -hmm. How did you structure that deal, that first deal, James? Uh, the JV deal mm -hmm. for the first apartment building? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we... In retrospect, I wish I had raised less capital or had fewer partners, I should say. We didn't have a lot of confidence. We only needed 200K. It was a $1.2 million building. We needed 200,000 bucks. And because of after repair, it was a crappy building. So there's a renovation, um, renovation portion of the business plan. The bank was willing to finance the cost of the renovation to get the rents up. That was the gig. So we only needed 200K. And we decided, okay, 200K feels like a lot of money. So let's divide this up into four $50,000 chunks and get four partners in play. You know, nowadays we're doing deals where it's like 250 is our minimum buy-in, but you know what, at that baby step phase, it felt like four partners at 50 was the right amount to ask for. And sure enough, it, that was what happened. And how do you structure, is it still the 50, 50 with the managing partner, money partner deal when, when, it, when it comes to um, the, the short answer to your question? The short answer to your question is yes, same exact, same exact high level structure. Okay. The difference is a corporation needed to own the building as opposed to an individual. Okay. So we incorporated, and then instead of a joint venture agreement, you have what's called a unanimous shareholders agreement. And then all partners are party to the unanimous shareholders agreement, which governs the partnership. But okay. at a glance, a unanimous shareholders agreement and a joint venture agreement have very, very similar content, similar clauses. They function and execute the same way. It's just one applies to corporations, one applies to individual entities doing business together. Okay. And would you stick with, have, you, know, I've, you know, you've done a lot of deals since. Um, what is your opinion on LLCs, limited liability corps, when it comes to a, uh, a commercial deal? I mean, I think they're fantastic. 
Um, and if we had to do it all over again, we probably would have done that. But again, in the same way that we were starting small and weren't really sure where this thing was going to go, so we did small chunks of 50,000, you know, an LLC is like a corporation costs a couple thousand bucks to get set up. Uh, a liability, limited liability corp costs tens of thousands of dollars to get set up. They're much more complicated. And so we thought, you know, in the scope of a $200,000 raise, we're not going to spend a quarter of our budget on the legal bill. You know, it just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. And this was our first building, so we're dabbling. We didn't think, okay, we're going to raise millions and millions of dollars and buy a couple dozen buildings like that. You know, we were just a couple of go-getters in our late twenties, buying an apartment building, kind of seeing what would work. So mm -hmm. I, I think LLC is a great structure. It's good if you're going to go big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's somebody out there listening where you've got a couple of million dollars in play, you've got a couple of colleagues with a couple million dollars in play, and you have the confidence and business plan in place to like, you know, do a several million dollar raise and approach a couple of $10 million worth of asset. Um, perfect structure for that. It's also really great if you want to insert more partners and do uh, subsequent rounds of capital raise and injection as the portfolio grows. So it's a great structure, but you know, it's, it's really powerful at a scale that we didn't start at. Mm -hmm. But again, if we did it all over again, we probably would have just done an LLC and just kept adding buildings and partners to it. But as it stands, we've got a couple of different partnerships with different buildings in each partnership. Okay. James, how does being a realtor play into, into that side of your business? Because obviously they're two, they're almost two different things, but they do align very well. They do. Yeah. I'd say they're very complimentary um, because I see a lot of deals and, you know, when you see a lot of deals, you just kind of pick away at the ones that, that catch your eye. So it's, it's definitely several of the deals we have done have come our way and we you know, grab them before we put them out to market. You know, I've had clients say like, well, why don't you just buy all the good deals? I'm like, if I bought every good deal I saw, I'd be made of money and then I wouldn't need to be buying real estate anymore. Like there's only, there's only so many deals you can physically buy with the time and, and, and uh, resources you have available. Um, so we're choosy with that. Then, then the, on the flip side of the coin, um, you know, we, we get to know our clients pretty well. We get to know what their interests are. Uh, what they'd be interested in investing in, things that they want to participate in. And so again, it's all about that little asterisk. So it, it does make raising capital a little bit more streamlined and a lot more um, uh, easy for us simply because if a good deal comes up, we already know who wants to look at a good deal if it comes up. So we're not scrambling to find partners. You know, We just search in our database who said in the last 12 months they might be interested in looking at a deal okay, here's the 50 people who all have a couple hundred K kicking around who said they'd be interested in a deal. Let's start calling. Them. Yeah. And you, and you also have all of the market comparables already. You already have that information. And I mean, cause that's yeah. typically that's the information you're going to be asked by, by a capital partner. They're going to want to know that they're going to want to know, you know, okay, well, what, if we're paying this, what, what are the other buildings worth? Where, you know, where Absolutely. do we fit in? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point as well. I mean, it just, it's my job to know the market. And so I can separate out good deals from not good deals very, very rapidly and, you know, confidently speak to the value of certain properties and whether or not they make sense uh, for a partnership pretty quickly. Okay, cool. Hey, James, when you go searching for a property, say, let's say, um, I know, I know there's a lot of people that's their game plan to you know, eventually transition into commercial properties, um, myself being one of them. What are five things you would want to, questions you want to ask or th five things you want to know before you kind of jump into that game? Into, into the that, commercial you know, game. Commercial game, yeah. All right. I'm going to say in no particular order, yeah. uh, in no particular order, I would say first thing that comes to mind is like understand what a cap rate is. And that's a basic thing to know, but you'd be surprised how many new investors we talk to who have listened to a couple of podcasts who bring us a piece of property and say, okay, I want a cap rate of this, or this property has a cap rate of that. And, you know, I very politely say, oh, how did you calculate that cap rate? And the chances are they might be talking about the cash on cash yield, or they might be talking about some other multiplier, but they heard the term cap rate and they wanted to not sound like a dummy when they came and talked to me. So now they're throwing around the word cap rate when, you know, you actually don't know what a cap rate is or how it works. So that's part. And the thing about a cap rate is it represents a mathematical relationship between two levers on a teeter totter, which are building value and that building's net operating income. 
So you have to understand how a net operating income can be manipulated, how that affects building value, and then how a cap rate slides within a market. So you're kind of, you're juggling three balls in multifamily, mm -hmm. which is building value, market cap, and net operating income. And then the net operating income, when you double click on it, becomes this very complex, easy to manipulate calculation. Whereas in single family, um, cash flow is relatively more easy to calculate because the mortgage payment plays into the cash flow calculations. And then the, the building value in single family is like, if the neighbor sold for this, that's what you're worth. Much easier to do comparable analysis, apples to apples in a multifamily or single family to multifamily. So without doing a tutorial on how that mathematical relationship works, that is an absolutely critical thing to be able to understand, articulate and understand how like those three, like if you pull this lever down, this one goes up. And then this one goes down a little bit. Oh, like understand how those levers will move in relation to each other. That's, that's very, very important. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, for our listeners, I just want to, you know, quickly articulate the fact that, or like cap rate is net operating income over purchase price. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then you base that market cap based on the cap rate, you know, compared to the market cap, and then that'll determine you know, where it. Can you, actually, um, this is one thing I've never really been clear on. How do you know the market cap? How do you calculate? That's where talk to your friendly local realtor. <laughs> so in the same way that like in residential, we go into MLS and pull all the recent sales so that we know what recent um, houses sold for. Mm -hmm. On the commercial side, we have a database of um, recent sales and what their caps were. Ah, okay. So you just compare that mark, your, your market cap versus other market caps and that'll exactly. determine. Okay. And yeah. uh, for, again, for our listeners, the difference between a residential um, comparable, which is just what your neighbor sell, sold for, and that determines your price, uh, commercial depends on the income of the property. And that determines uh, oftentimes the value of the property. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. The income is what really matters. Again, mm -hmm. the, the cap rate is net operating income divided by building value. So mm -hmm. even, even just like for those of you who just hate math, you're going to have to get comfortable with the fact that there is like, it's a, tr it's a three variable equation. So like cap rate equals net operating income divided by building value. Okay. If you move those, if you, if you do the basic algebra to move the, those variables around building value equals net operating income divided by cap rate. Okay. Oh, or we, you know, like, so like, you know, like a equals B divided by C Well, B equals a times C and C equals B over a. For those of you who didn't catch that in grade eight algebra, sorry, but like that's, <laughs> you have to be able to, yeah, it, it, you have to be able to understand how that equation manipulates so that you know how those three variables interact. So if that's going to be number one, so maybe this is in an order because like until you figure out the cap rate triangle of net operating income, building value cap rate and how to calculate NOI, you're going to have a hard time analyzing buildings. That's plus, you need, plus you need the actual financials of a building to determine whether the cap rate is accurate or not. Yeah. And I'm going to segue that and I'll make that number two, understanding the difference between actual projected and stabilized. So let's take NOI, understanding NOI will be point two. Um, actual is how the building is performing right now based on the financials from the last couple of years. Then you'll get a word called stabilized, which means, well, the current owner is cutting corners and under renting it and you know, they spent too much on plumbing, but the building really should be at this. So this is what you'll get for the building. So like the real NOI should be higher. Therefore you should pay more for the building as a buyer. You're going to say, well, no, the building's performing what the financial say it's performing at. So I want to pay less. And then a lot of realtors will say projected saying, oh, the market's growing. So while I know the numbers look bad right now, once you stabilize the building and the market grows, this is the projected value of the building. So therefore you should pay more for it. So being able to understand, ask, analyze, and do your due diligence on where, where is the actual, what is the stabilized, what is the projected, and where is the gap in between? Learning how to do that dig, that's number two. And then we'll circle it back into number one. Once you've done that dig, how to flow that net operating income that comes out of that dig into the, the cap rate calculation. Number three, understanding how commercial financing works. So in residential financing, you get a $500,000 place, 20% down is 100K, bing, bang, boom. That's the interest rate. Call it a day. Not that complicated. Mm -hmm. In commercial, and the reason this will be number three is because you have to understand number one to understand number three. Different lenders are going to lend at different cap rates. So bank one might say, you know, 
we feel like we're going to lend on this building via a five and a half cap. Bank number two might say, no, we think this building is riskier. We're only going to lend at a 5.75 cap. Bank number three might say, well, we'll lend at a five cap, but we want more percentage down. So like the cap rate that they're willing to lend at, what, what percentage down payment they want, the length of amortization that they're going to give you, the term they're going to give you, and the interest rate they're going to give you are all variable based on that, based on that bank's perception of the risk in the back building that you're buying. Whew, that's a lot. Okay, so in number one, you have to do a mathematical juggle between three variables. In number three, now you've got like four or five levers that, you know, like, okay, down payment goes down. Ooh, I really like the idea of putting 15% down, but then cap rate goes up. So now you're buying the building. So now the bank's funding you at less than your purchase price. So even though you're putting 15% down of the bank's perceived value, you have to fill that $100,000 gap between the bank's value and what you're paying. If anybody who's listening to this think this is coming really fast, it is. There are like weekend long courses that go over what I'm trying to cover in like two minutes. So, <laughs> so the question I'm answering is really, what do you need to know? You need to know that. You need to know how those variables get manipulated and how those, var like, how that, how those teeter-totters tip and balance when you're doing the financing. Number four? four. Number four. Four, yeah, four. What, what to look for when you're going through the building. So when you buy a single family building, usually it's, like sometimes they're tenanted, usually they're not. You're just looking at the physical condition of the building and asking yourself, how will this rent? When you buy a multifamily asset, the tenant in place is basically like another fixture in the building. So you really have to be able to look at who's living in the building and assign a value to that. And I mean, don't take that the wrong way and saying like we're, we're giving subjective value on human lives here, but you know, a ten, not all tenants treat the property equally. So somebody who has the place in tip top shape has never been laid on the rent and, you know, their suite looks amazing and everything's in a great state of repair versus a suite that's full of junk, smells like cigarette smoke. The person's laid every other month and they like, you know, give you a dirty look just for being in the building. Like those two tenants, both of them come with the building. They're part of the purchase and they, they form part of your valuation of perception of value in the building. So knowing how to assign value to the tenancies or the value of the lease agreements as you go suite by suite by suite by suite. Getting a feel for that, super important. You don't really have to deal with that in single family because half the time, no, 90% of the time you're buying a vacant building, you get to pick your tenant. Mm -hmm. In multifamily, it's coming with the people that are there. So you really have to be able to like do a deep due diligence into what you're going to be working with because you know, in Al Alberta is the easiest province in the country to flip tenants over. But if you're dealing in most provinces, like transitioning the group of people in a building can be a one to three year process. And if you've got a few bad apples, you're getting a double whammy because you've got bad apples making the building worse, scaring away the good tenants. And now you have vacancies over here that are bleeding cash because good tenants left. And you're spending money, time and headache trying to get rid of bad tenants who aren't paying rent potentially. So now it's like a double vacancy and a pending renovation. So don't walk into a building and just say like, oh yeah, they're a little messy, but we can work with this. Like mm, be a little more perceptive to what that person in the building actually means for your experience and the cost it's going to cost you to manage the building. Awesome. Um, and number five, I'm going to go back to my number one criteria, which is be very mindful of location. I'll, like uh, you can buy the best building in a location that sucks and make no money. And you can buy a garbage building in a location that's on the up and up and look like a genius. Yeah, I quite often see uh, apartment buildings, you know, come through the inbox and it's in a strange location, but low cost per door. And I just look at the tenant demographic that is going to be renting in that building. And I, it doesn't even fit tenant demographic for the residential sector that we invest in. So yeah, yeah I mean, location's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... One of one of my one of one of the things that I, I have learned time and time and time again in real estate is that real estate is a market driven asset and anything that's cheap is cheap for a reason. So if something seems cheap in real estate, it's a good good time to stop and say why. Because cheap almost never equates to it's a good deal. It's cheap for a reason. So why are you paying less for that property? Always a, that's, that's always an important question to ask in due diligence. Now, the answer to that question might be a comfortable answer for you. Oh, it's cheap because it's a crappy location. Okay, 
I can deal with a crappy location because I'm happy with the cash flow. It might be cheap because this person's desperate and I need to come up with an exorbitant amount of cash on no timeline and don't get the luxury and security of being able to do complete due diligence. Okay, I'm okay with that reason. Great, let's go. But in real estate, if it's cheap, it's always cheap for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if, if that's your strategy, then, hey, um, that's great. I mean, we, we know people that uh, invest specifically into those uh, lower end demographic locations where pr prices are cheap for that exact reason. Yeah. But that's their gig. And, and there's nothing wrong with it if that's your gig. But you should be wary if it isn't your gig. And it's not what if you're looking for boring hands off uh, wealth building real estate that mm -hmm. you can put you know, good tenants in and, and reasonably expect the property be, to be in uh, not too bad a condition when you have to put a new tenant in, then you're going to be bitterly uh, disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, you Buckle know, up. Time. Yeah, exactly. So between residential and commercial, James, I mean, I'm assuming commercial is your preference at this point, just because of... You know... I don't know. And I'm not saying I, I, I didn't pause because I don't like commercial. I paused because similar to the comments we just made about like know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Residential versus commercial is the same thing. Like they both have pros and cons. You know, I mean, you guys have built a really lovely portfolio of residential assets that's doing great. And like nothing sucks about that portfolio. Well, I'm sure there's some challenges, but like yeah, you, know, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you know, good for the most part, right? You always yeah, make good, some good for the most part. You. Probably, and probably should have bought, but whatever. <laughs> it is what it is. So it is like, what... you know, I would stay, I I'm going to be, I'll give the more it depends answer because, you know, that's what us professionals do. And the thing the, the one of the biggest advantages of commercial is because of all of this math that I described that you have to get your head wrapped around. If you get a mastery of that math, you can create huge swings of wealth and value in the building very, very quickly by just understanding where to alter the spreadsheet with very minimal force put in. So if you can get a mastery of manipulating those variables, you know, you can take, you always hear these stories of like, oh, I bought the building for a million and repositioned it. And then it was worth two. And I pulled out half a million dollars. Like that stuff actually does happen. And that's because people understand the math of how those variables fit together. Um, the other, the other pro of going commercial is like, if you have a million dollars of cash, you can buy 10, $500,000 houses at 20% down, $100,000 down payment per, per, per house. Mm -hmm. Or you could buy one $5 million building at 20% down. That one building is not going to be 10 times more work than the 10 houses. In fact, it's going to be significantly less work than the 10 houses. So when you start thinking about your property, not only in terms of return on investment, but in terms of return on time, you get much, much more efficient use of your capital in terms of the hours you have in a day, a week, a month, a year, and can create more wealth with less time invested if you have that higher level of capital to play with, which is one of the reasons I like multifamily, because now that we're confident enough to be raising larger dollar values of capital from our investors, it's easier to place more capital more quickly with less time invested. And, um, you know, I mean... At the end of the day, you have $5 million of asset appreciating at market. So do I want that $5 million of asset to represent managing 10 houses or one building? How, what's your perspective on the liquidity side? So where, where you have one building versus 10 houses, if you have the 10 houses, you can sell two right away if you want to and still keep eight. Of course. I mean, big buildings are far less liquid than houses. The due diligence period on a multifamily building is 90 days and it, you know, a house it's 10 to 14 days and they both have the same probability of not working out so you know i mean you can go through two or three unqualified buyers and still have your house sold in 60 days if you go through two or three unqualified buyers on the multifamily side it could take you a year to sell that building so you have to be okay with the stability of that illiquidity and what that represents or you make it cheap for a reason i gotta sell quick mm -hmm. And the, and the uh, due diligence aspect of a multifamily is also quite uh, more expensive than a uh, single oh, family too, right? Significantly, yeah, significantly. I mean, uh, with a house, you're doing a $600, $700 home inspection. Um, with, with multifamily, environmental reports, engineering reports, fire reports. Um, and then 
you in single family, uh, the bank pays the mortgage broker in um, multifamily, you as the client pays the mortgage broker's fee, and often you pay a lender fee as well. So to borrow two million bucks can cost you like a twenty thousand dollar loan placement fee, and then the legal bills are way higher because it's a more complicated purchase. So like, you just spend more money in all the things. You know, if you want to buy a twenty unit, let's say two and a half three million dollar building, your closing costs are going to be in the ballpark of like thirty to forty thousand dollars. Whereas if you want to buy a five hundred thousand dollar house you know, $1,500 legal bill and a $700 inspection and a $300 appraisal and like, psh, good to go. Mm-hmm. And the worst part is you can spend all the money and still might not go through. It might. Which, which I have, which I have, I probably invested, you know, close to a hundred grand in due diligence over the course of my career for buildings that haven't worked out. It's just part of the game. Mm-hmm. Brutal. But I mean, that's the game you play, right? So it comes back to also sometimes aligning with what it is you're trying to achieve too. You know, like, like, like you say, James, you need to be educated in, in exactly what it is you're trying to uh, obtain. If you are looking to go into the commercial realm, purchase commercial buildings, get educated so you know exactly what you're up against and then go and make that move. But if it's not really what you're trying to do, well, then just stick with the single families or stick with whatever yeah. it is you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Then you're, totally. not at, you're not at risk then of losing the money without fully understanding what it is that you're... you're yeah. I mean, that's, that's independently of real estate investing 101, you know, is don't, don't invest money. You can't lose. Yeah. Any investment really. Yeah. Something you mentioned last year about your brokerage business, how you were last at that time, you were still providing the majority of the production in your brokerage. Yeah. 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 And, and your goal was to get to 10% of production and then, you know, be the entrepreneur as, you know, as yeah. uh, Michael Gerber like to say of, and just manage the direction of where the business goes. How is that coming? You know what? <laughs> we, uh, so my, my office manager, shout out Aurora, bless her heart, um, took our annual production tracking spreadsheet and made a nice little pie chart out of it. And my production was 16% last year. So down from down from the twenties the year before, but not quite hitting the 10. So we'll see how 2021 goes. But uh, yeah, my goal was to be 10% of the production. I got to 16. So let's see how we do. What are, what are the systems that you're implementing to kind of, I guess, move you away from being um, a technician and move you more towards the entrepreneurial role? Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about rewarding top producing realtors so that they want to stay with the team and top producing realtors have needs and, um, and wants. So we've really tweaked a lot of the business. And we actually had a discussion with some of our top agents today on like, Hey, what are the things that you guys need to see in order for you to want to be on the team versus not on the team? Um, because, you know, I mean, if we lose a productive realtor, it, it kind of takes a step backwards, not a step forwards. So that's, mm-hmm. that's an important part of the equation. And, you know, a big part of that system, realtors need admin support. That's, you know, I mean, it's easy to do five, six, seven, eight deals in a month when you don't have to do any paperwork. So one of our constant um, top of mind conversations is how to provide better and better and better administrative systems and support so that the agents can focus on what they're good at, which is relationship building and deal finding, as opposed to paperwork filling out. I think that's a massive component for any real estate related business. I mean, we, we can relate to that just as investors and we're not, we're not doing realtor deals, uh, you know, of that magnitude every single month, (laughs) but just the admin side of things, even on the, when you're doing joint ventures, I mean, the document control is extreme. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of paper involved in this business and it has to be filled out correctly and accurately. And, um, it has to be done usually in a very timely manner. So it's like the admin game in real estate is like, it's a double whammy because you very rarely is getting it done fast and getting it done error-free congruent with one another. You usually get one or the other. So there's a lot of pressure to do it fast and error-free in real estate, which is why having a great admin system is such a invaluable asset. Yeah. And the more people you have touching the paperwork, the more likely it is that an error is going to occur. So <laughs> I can't exactly. imagine like trying to have an admin person just perfectly and, and everything's sent out digitally nowadays. So it's very easy yeah. for something to be sent off the shelf and it, you know, maybe a condition's not correct or whatever it might be. 
Yeah. So, I mean, to get a little more granular, like we have a certain hierarchy of paperwork where there's certain paperwork that um, there is a tolerance for error that is not critically deal alteringly uh, impactful. So if that paperwork isn't handled perfectly, it's okay. We can fix it. You know, we like, sorry, typo, fix it. And then there's some paperwork where like, let's talk about an easy example, condition waiver. That gets filled out incorrectly. That gets submitted late. That doesn't get signed on time. You lose the deal. That's a catastrophic failure that results in a major loss of revenue and a very unhappy client and potentially losing a client. So like, depending on our hierarchy of importance of paperwork, there are different protocols in place for how that gets handled and who reviews it and, you know, how many double checks there are so that it can happen, you know, more quickly with an error-free delivery. If you founded Mogul, do you have... I don't know what's the best word, like lieutenants that you that you defer a lot of your work to, or do you just have a, yeah. a, a like army of uh, assistants that kind of help you uh, deal with the admin I, stuff? I mean, yeah, no, no army has just generals and no, no, or no lieutenants and no uh, colonels. I I don't know what what are the rankings. <laughs> it takes. <laughs> I'm rolling with the analogy here, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I so our org chart is like I'm the CEO. And then we've got a general manager in each city who's our top producing agent slash helped manage the sales team. So, you know, shout outs in Edmonton, that's Adrian Nedelec, um, one of the top realtors in Edmonton. And then in Vancouver, shout out, that's Eric Huds, who's our general manager. So, you know, I help them uh, lead, inspire and coach the sales team. And then I kind of pop in where needed. So if there's complex cases or, you know, somebody just needs extra attention because they're struggling with the business case, that's where I come in for additional coaching. Awesome. And you guys recently joined with EXP. Is that? Uh... Yeah. 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 I'd say about uh, 20 months ago now. Yeah. Give Man. or take. Year, year oh, and a half ish. Time does fly. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, so going? even last time you guys were already with EXP, you didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. We had, yeah. I think we might have just switched over. I mean, I love the company. I think it's fabulous. Um, it's been on a very interesting journey lately. Like the, I mean, it's a publicly traded company and the stocks were at like, two dollars when we joined and then uh right after christmas they went up to 80 dollars, which was pretty wild wow. so like you know and i mean we got we got a bunch of stock options when we joined so that's kind of cool but so like we're feeling like a million bucks like every day we log in and it's like another five percent growth but then and i mean i'm no stock market guy so i don't know what the hell's going on so it's gone from 80 dollars back down to about 25 over the last two months so like i've just watched this downward line and i'm like this is why I invest in real estate. This is like breaking my brain right now. <laughs> like if this was my only, if this was like my entire nest egg, I would be ready to jump off a bridge. So hopefully, you know, that line goes back up this year at some point because of the the powers of the stock market. But, you know, either way, like it's, it's cool to be a part of a company that is doing things that traditionally aren't part of the real estate business, like offering stock options to employees for performance. Um, you know, it's very similar to Keller Williams where, it is like employee owned and uh, the profit is shared among the employees or a portion of the profit is shared among the employees, which I really liked. And um, it's kind of got that tech startup feel. You know, when I joined, there were 20,000 agents. Now we're at like 58,000 agents. So, I mean, the company is literally one and a half times double uh, since we joined. So it's cool. It's just, it's a fun environment to be a part of, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just exciting. It's just really exciting. And so not sure where it's going to go, but it's, I mean, it's gone some pretty amazing places since we joined and I'm just happy to be along for the ride. Do you plan to take another uh, mini vacation anytime soon, mini retirement? Yeah. Yeah, I sure do. I, uh, once the Vancouver team is as settled as the Edmonton team, I'm probably going to take half a year to a year off and do okay. a, I do a mini, do another mini retirement. Um, not sure where yet, but. COVID then, makes yeah. that a little difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID was almost like a mini retirement. Like, I mean, it was super quiet there for a few months. And I went to, I got like, I was working maybe 20 hours a week and I was just home all the time and going for walks in the river Valley and going mountain biking every day. And I was like, if I took a mini retirement. This is kind of what my life would look like. Hmm. So, you know, it was almost like a forced break in the middle of the year that I didn't anticipate. Mm hmm. I mean, it's good that you can view it that way, right? A little break before the things got really hectic there. But uh... yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I try not to say that disrespectfully because I know not everybody had a great experience as a result of COVID. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the universe just basically from, from my journey said like, hey, we're just going to give you a period where there's not a heck of a lot to do. 
and we're going to force you to slow down. And by the way, you're not allowed to have a social life. So you just got to hang out and like work on your hobbies. And I was like, okay, universe, I guess that's what we're doing. I think you're going to be pretty busy for the next little while here, James, while you're getting uh, Vancouver sorted. And totally. Yeah. I think it's going to be about a year and a half to two year turnaround before the Vancouver is a, a juggernaut comparable to the Edmonton office. And then, then it'll be time to treat myself to a little, uh, to a little mini vacation or mini retirement, I should say. Well, yeah, I think you will have earned it by that stage. Yeah. James, gonna, what, uh, <laughs> what, what's your thoughts on, on the market here? What's, what's going to happen later, later this year and into next year? What are you, what are you thinking? Uh, well, Vancouver's already started to cool off. So I think, I think we're going to see steady, stable, like we're going to see Vancouver style growth, steady, stable. We had this like white hot period that just, that's already started to subside a little bit. Um, I think Alberta is like really poised for some growth. You know, I mean, we had an early spring market. February behaved like what May normally behaves like into March, which was kind of, you know, kind of cool. But things are leveling off in mid-May when they normally level off in mid-June. So that's kind of, that's my, I mean, that's observing what's happening right now. But I think heading into next year, like, I mean, one of the words that we're hearing all over the place is inflation, inflation, inflation. And one of the assets that's most intimately tied to inflation is real estate. So, you know, I think, I think that we're going to see the value of real assets increase over the next 18 months. And that's not going to be an Alberta phenomenon. That'll be a global phenomenon. But I mean, for anybody that's owned property in Alberta over the last 10 years, it's going to be nice to see some property equity growth because it's, uh, it's been a pretty flat market on the equity side. Great on the cash flow side, mm -hmm. but, you know, it'll be good to see some growth uh, come back to Alberta. Yeah, I know it's funny because you know, I've been investing for the last you know, seven years or so. And we started, I mean, Brad and I, we think we both started more or less in the beginning of the, this whole down market with the oil and since it, 2014. Yeah. And it's been a great ride. Truth be told, if you, everything cash flows or a lot of things cash flow quite well. Yeah. It's funny that when you're still in the acquisition phase, when you see this, all this equity gain, this, you know, it's great for your existing portfolio, but when it comes to new acquisitions, it's, you got, you got to kind of reframe things now. I know. Well, it's, yeah, it's kind of, that's like the, the Alberta plight is just peeking over the fence and watching properties double in the last, sometimes triple in the last seven years in Vancouver and Ontario thinking like, maybe I should have bought a couple over there in the meantime, because like our properties values have remained fairly stable, even though the cash flow was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. You look at deals today and and the same property a couple of years ago, you looked at it and went, oh, that cash flow is fantastic. Now today you're thinking, how do I get that property for a little less? Because the cash flow is not really working like it used to. And it's yeah. literally, you know, two years on. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens with the numbers and what still works and what doesn't from a cash flow perspective. Because I mean, like you say, yeah. James, that's what, we, that's what we bank on here in Alberta. So Totally. Yeah. It'll be good to see some rental growth because, you know, taxes, utilities, and insurance have been inflating. So the rents have got to catch up too. Mm -hmm. So I guess for Western Canada investors, since you're kind of all over the place now, what would be a piece of advice you would give them at this point? I, I know the, it, may, it can be more than one. I know there's the markets. Are I'll, quite keep it, different. I'll keep it super simple. Um, you know, diversify, like don't, you know, one of the one of the pieces of advice that, you, that I, I can't remember who said it, I think it might've been Don Campbell, is like, be a neighborhood specialist, know your neighborhood, know your property type and buy the same thing over and over and over again, which is, you know, I mean, it makes the management piece of the business easy, but I mean, if you had spread it around, like, you know, if you were going to buy five properties, if you had bought one in Victoria, one in Vancouver, one in Kelowna, one in Edmonton, one in Calgary, in the last five years, I think net worth wise, you'd be a heck of a lot further ahead than if you had bought them all in Edmonton or all in Calgary. Um, but cash flow wise, you'd be also further ahead than if you'd bought them all in Vancouver or all in Kelowna. So, you know, it's, I'm, I, the more, the more I mature as an investor, the more I appreciate why diversity in a portfolio um, really serves you because there are just so many X factors that can, you know, that are completely outside of your control that can totally mess with Mojo if you're invested in only one thing. For example, the story about the EXP stocks. If if my entire net worth was tied up in that EXP stock, it's like, okay, I just watched my net worth go up by 2000% and then back down by like, you know, 2000%. That'd give me a heart attack, you know? Or if I owned all my property in one neighborhood and then all of a sudden the city was like, yeah, we were gonna build a park, but we're actually gonna build a super noisy, like, or we're going to rezone this park that everybody thought they were going to enjoy. And now this park is going to be like, 
a McDonald's. And it's like, okay, now I'm, now I'm like living in the shadow of the smell of like McDonald's fries, instead of having this park for all my investment properties to enjoy. Like you just, there are things that happen that you cannot control. And so having diversity levels out the mystery of the X factors. Good advice. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely different than what a lot of people get taught. I have to admit. So even if you, the law of books you read, you know, be a neighbor specialist, be a geographic specialist. And, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I followed that advice for a while too. And then, you know, I, it's the more I learned, the more I was like, well, if you're supposed to diversify your stock portfolio, why aren't you supposed to diversify your real estate portfolio? Wait a second. But then you look at Warren Buffett, you know, and granted he is diversified in the sense that he buys whole companies, but you know, his whole idea is, you know, was it buy, have one basket, put all your eggs in one basket and just watch that basket. <laughs> I mean, it's easy for him to say that, but Berkshire Hathaway owns a bazillion different companies in a bazillion different industries. So like his basket's full of a bunch of multicolored eggs. Like yeah. he's, he's diversified. I, I don't buy it. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> James, what's the best way for uh, anyone that wants to reach out to get in contact with you? I mean, I, I'm easy to find on social media. Uh, Facebook, James J. Canal, or email me. Yeah, if you guys can put my email in the description, james at mogulrg.com, and then our website's www.mogulrg.com. But I mean, Too we easy. we market hard. If you Google my name, I will come up. Perfect. Easy done. Well, mate, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us. And yeah, this was uh, a blast. I uh, I just you know I'm honored to get the repeat invite. I know I know you guys have a lot of choices for guests, and I'm glad to to be one of them. So thanks so much for shooting the breeze with me about real estate for another awesome afternoon. Oh, thank you, man. Awesome. That was, yeah, appreciate it. That was fun. That was good. And um, yeah, hopefully I'll catch you down the road for another episode. Hey, you know what? I'll put a little X on my calendar 14 months from now, and I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> Before well, just seeing how uh, how the yeah, Vancouver office pans out and how your goal for your ten percent production works out. Oh, that'll maybe. be that'll be a fun check in. Yeah, a yeah. couple couple of weeks into the mini retirement, maybe you'll be on a beach and we'll we'll catch up there. You know what? Yeah, <laughs> Let's do that. That'll we, that'll uh, be check. That'll probably be check in number four, twenty eight months from now. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll hold you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Right on. Thanks All again. Right. Thanks, man.